you finally have a Muslim on a TV show that's not a terrorist. You have a person with a disability that's actually played by someone with a disability and they don't just want to kill themselves or feel sorry for themselves. We're just telling our own stories. This week on Between You and Me, I sit down with actor and comedian Steve Way. Steve was born with muscular dystrophy and is a champion for disability rights. He's most recently been in the spotlight starring as himself in the hit Hulu show, Rami. You now have a season two of Rami, congratulations. Thank you. Did you feel like when you read the script that you knew it was gonna be golden? I knew it was gonna be something special. I knew that people were gonna resonate with it and that it was really going to have an impact on people's lives regardless of their way of life or their religion. And you and Rami are friends in real life, right? Yes. How did the creative process kind of unfold? Well, Rami really wanted to make sure that all my parts were authentic to me. You know, he always tells people that the situations may not be real, but the feelings are, um, you know, the emotions are. So he wanted to make sure that really every little detail was specific to me and to my story. And I think really that's why the show is so good, is because of how authentic it is. Why do you think that you had such a connection in real life? I mean, I think we just really understood each other. You know, if you saw um, the end of episode four, how his character and my character met around 9-11, it's all real. That was right when we started to be on close. Once we got into high school, we started uh, TV classes. So we were always taking out cameras, filming things, and that was really the beginning That's so of cool. our creative journey together. Do you feel like the Muslim experience and an experience of somebody who is living with disability is similar in the way that maybe people perceive you as outsiders? You know, obviously everyone's story is different, but you know, I don't obviously don't want to compare um, the amount of vitriol that the Muslim community has faced, especially in this area, for the last 20 years. But there is definitely a lot of uh, misconstrued notions and perspectives of our different communities. And that's really just ignorance. Mm. What for you would be sort of the, the best take away after watching the series? I think really the best, best case scenario from this show is that people just see me as a regular person. I don't want people to not see my disability because then you erase my struggles and the barriers that I face every day. But I don't want you to feel sorry for me. Um, I'm not dying. I just want you to know that I am living the life that I want. And I'm happy with it. Having somebody who has a disability playing somebody who has a disability in you know, the film or a television show, why is that so important? Like Brian Cranston, for example, got a lot of flack for well playing. Deserved. Do you think it was well deserved? Of course it was. So, because his role, just so people, if people don't know, like, you know, he was in this film, The Upside, with Kevin Hart, and people gave him a lot of shit for playing somebody who has a disability when, of course, he, he doesn't. Why do you think it was well-deserved then that he got that flag? Well, what was really infuriating was that he doubled down on it and called it a business decision. Why couldn't I play that part? There's no reason why someone like me or many other disabled performers could have played that part. The only reason why he got it is because his name is Brian Traston. What do you think about the argument some people have which uh, they might say, well, you know, it's good to have distance from like a character to be able to really like authentically play that character. Do you buy that kind of line? No, thinking? because it's more than just a character. It's my life. I don't know any different. He does. When I see that, I, just, I don't buy it. I don't believe it because it's not real. And I know, yes, Movies are movies, but it all goes back to the viewer's perception. Mm. It, it's very damaging to the entire community. Is there an element of 
making a viewer feel more comfortable so that they don't actually have to confront a reality of somebody with disability. Absolutely. I mean, I know that whenever I go on stage to do stand-up comedy, people are automatically uncomfortable. And I can't blame them for that. I know what I'm getting myself into. So it's up to me to make my audience comfortable. And I know people who watched Rami felt the same way. But too bad. I don't care. You're gonna watch me, you're gonna laugh, and you're gonna learn my story. Uh, you see, most people think that I have cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is where your brain is injured at birth. My brain has been injured by Twitter. Can you just explain for people who don't know, so, you know, what is muscular dystrophy? Yeah, basically muscular dystrophy is where your muscles cannot take in the proteins that they need to develop. Uh, mine is super rare. Um, I didn't find out really what I have until I was 25. Um, I'm the only person in my family with it. I've talked to multiple doctors and hopefully it ends with me so I won't pass it on. You kind of almost use it maybe like humor and stand up almost like as a self-defense mechanism. Yes. Right. Do you get flack from other people in the disability community for doing that, for sort of deflecting uncomfortability, I guess, through yeah, humor? There, there are definitely a few um, who don't like that. Um, you know, my dad always jokes that whenever I do stand up, um, I set back the disability rights movement for like 50 years. Um, you know what? It's me, and I'm gonna do what I want, and I'm gonna do what I think is best to make people not just more aware, but more comfortable with us. You know, when I do stand up, it's really one part making people laugh and one part educating. Mm. Um, because I know that when I start, they've probably never seen someone like me, and if they have, it's definitely not in that setting. Stand-up comedy seems like a hard place to be, just period, right? How much more challenging was it for you, kind of coming up through stand-up? The act of stand-up was easy. I have been public speaking since I was 10 years old. So to just infuse that with my humor, I was able to pick up pretty quickly. The hard part is finding places where I can do it. Because not many people are really aware that New York comedy is not very accessible to people like me. Um, you know, I always wonder where my career would be at now if I was able to perform at places like UCB, who just recently uh, became accessible. Because for years, I mean, it's, it's all comedy sellers, right? Like, it's like down steps like in that. basements. The underground, the cellar, can't do any of it. What do they say to you? What, what are they, do they just have excuses yeah. or? Well, yeah, I've, I've heard it all. Really? You know, I had too much money, the building was too old. It's, I don't know, you know, it's all BS. It's the law, right? Like it's the, the, AD, the ADA yes. kind of says yes. you have to make it accessible. It is the law. It is older than I am. But you know, when, when you have no governing body to enforce it, it's up to people like me to play the cop, and nobody really wants to listen to us. What are some of the fights that you have to fight right now as a disabled American? For over a year now, almost a year and a half, I've been trying to move out of my parents' house and move in with my girlfriend. Now, right now, I receive 40 hours of care per week because apparently my life is a nine to five job. So to move out, I need more hours so I can have someone with me during the day while my girlfriend works. And for over a year now, the state of New Jersey has told me that I am not disabled enough. That you're not disabled enough? Yes. And every time I meet with someone or every time someone from the government comes to my house 
just to make sure I'm still disabled, they are amazed at why I'm not given more hours. So it doesn't even make a difference? Like, your, your presence on our screens doesn't make a difference when it comes to government bureaucracy? I cannot change the system by myself. This is a group effort. This is not only making the public aware, but politicians aware, lobbyists aware, and healthcare CEOs aware. And they will do anything in their power to save a dollar. And that means not giving me more hours. It means withholding prescription medications. It means giving me my medical supplies only four times a year instead of every month. I do you feel like people have any awareness that this is what life is like? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, healthcare in this country is something that, unfortunately, I do understand because it is greed and capitalism. What I do not understand is how the people in this country have not just rioted. Trump administration just this year announced that it was going to be working with the Social Security Administration to essentially monitor people's Facebook yes. posts, right? Monitor their social media yeah. to make sure to like verify their disability. Yeah. Yeah. When you hear a policy like that, what do you think? I mean, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me at all. Um, especially when you're dealing with, you know, what's called what it is, a fascist administration. Is that how you feel about it? it it's a fascist administration? I mean, they want to monitor people's online presence. Yeah, that's 21st century fascism. And the summer of 2017 was the closest that Medicare and Medicaid has ever gotten to be cut. And it was that summer when disability groups like ADAPT put their lives on the line and saved it. But it was what, one or two votes away? This is when this is when organizations like ADAPT were sort of doing sit-ins yes. in Congress people's offices yes. and protesting exactly. and being also. carried away, dragged out of oh, offices. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, dragged out of their wheelchairs. And it was also during this time when Congressman Steve Scalise got shot. So now he you know, comes back, gives a speech about how great it is to be back, you know, he's on crutches, and then votes to take away people's health care. So for you, when people talk about 2020, who are you excited about? Which of the 2020 candidates, and there are like a gajillion of them, who are you most excited about? Who do you think has actually got a fully formed policy that has disabled Americans in mind? Right now, it's either for me, Bernie or Warren. We really need someone who has um, those socialist policy ideas. You know, this fight for more care hours has really pushed me to identify as a socialist. What I hear from candidates like Booker or Harris, yes, I support Medicare for all. Eh, uh, what's holding on to those insurance companies though? No, that is not Medicare for all. You cannot have a system where everyone is able to get what they need, but still have the bureaucracy of capitalism. You know, I know the people that deny me whatever I need, they have no idea who I am or what I do or why I need it. All they see is a dollar sign. If Trump gets reelected, what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for the disability community? It's just four more years of losing sleep over is my health care going to be cut? It's four more years of worrying about what we put online. Are benefits going to be cut? It's just a constant worrying, a struggle, a fight, just to get the basic things that we need to survive. I would say about 80% of my family voted for Trump. 80% of your family? Yeah, at least. So if they know me and if they've seen me grow up and they've seen me gone, everything I've gone through, and they still think, yeah, that's the better alternative. How the heck, I mean, if you can't 
you know, change the minds of the people that, you know, love you and are closest to you. What hope, I suppose, do advocates and allies as well as disability community have changing, you know, the general public's mind? Well, I, I genuinely do think that the future is bright. I'm a high school substitute teacher. My students are so well informed. They're engaged. They know what's going on. They're afraid. And they are angry at the world and the people that have set up everything for them. And they are about to really take things into their own hands. So I genuinely do have faith for the future. I honestly do think it will get worse before we get there. But I think we will get there. Thank you for watching Between You and Me. There are plenty more episodes, so you can click here and subscribe to watch more.